Hey everyone, I'm Emily, and well, I... Well, this is an interesting setup, isn't it? So, anyway, if you don't know who I am, I'm Emily. I'm a Lovecraft scholar, which means I tell people weird stuff that they never asked about. So anyway, a few months ago, I don't even want to look at the date, I did a part one about Lovecraft stories I like, so... If you want to check that out, you can. So, yeah, anyway, making videos is a bit hard for me because there's this thing called anxiety I have, and then there's this thing called charisma that I don't have. But at the same time, I feel like being neurotic and have all my neuroses is very Lovecraftian, isn't it? So, like, editing this is a total nightmare because I actually hate the sound of my own voice and, and, you know, like, I don't hate how I look, but still, you know, having this sit for, like, a 15-minute video and look at it is a little difficult. But you didn't come here to hear about my uh, personal trauma, you know, that's a subject for a whole other video. You came to hear about Lovecraft stories that I recommend. So welcome to Best Lovecraft Stories Part 2, The Lovecraftian, and if you see me looking the side, I have like, literally my notes are just like the title of the story with like one or two weird comments. This is more off the cuff than usual, not me just like reading a bunch of notes. So let's just get started. So first, like, well, it's not the first, but on this thing, you're, you're never going to believe it. You are never going to believe the Lovecraft story I'm about to tell you about. It's called The Call of Cthulhu. Now, I know that Cthulhu is a very obscure pop culture reference, like, you know, Shub Nigerath and Narlatotep and Yogg-Sagoth, you know, those are way more popular, you see all the plushies of them, but, you know, Cthulhu is a little more obscure, so you've probably never heard of this one. So, Call of Cthulhu. So, I read it for the second time uh, recently, and all I can really tell you is, it's a lot more racist than I remember, but, you know, putting that aside, if one can put it aside. It's a very good mystery. I think something I appreciate and I struggle to find the, wor the word for it, but Lovecraft stories, I always feel it have this kind of repertorial, which he did am amateur journalism, so that makes sense. It has this very, like, he's reporting, like, all this research, and I feel like it's very immersive. The only, I don't know if it's a criticism I personally have, but is a criticism I've heard that it's a little anticlimactic that you have all this stuff about Cthulhu making people lose their minds and all this mystery, all these murders and these cult rituals and the swamps and all that, and then basically it ends with this encounter where I believe it's an island. It has all this weird geometry that is almost indescribable. Like there's a, I can't remember if it's convex or concave, but there's a place that it acts like it should be like this, but it actually acts like this, and it's all very interesting, and they encounter Cthulhu and run away from him, and eventually Cthulhu um, dies slash goes back to sleep when he's hit by a boat, and the story ends, and some might say that's very anticlimactic. Now, I guess I didn't really care. I think it's kind of funny. I kind of like how useless Cthulhu is. Um, not that, you know, a priest, he's supposed to be like the priest of the old gods, like, not that a priest is useless, you know, you got your tank, your DPS, you need a, a healer, you know, so he's not completely useless, but overall, yeah, I call it Cthulhu, a very popular, there's RPG, there's the uh, game, which is actually about the shadow over Innsmouth, but it's a, it's a good read. Okay, next we got Pikmin's model, so... Oh, oh my god. Let's just say that, like, I'm such a continuity ho. So, if you read The Dream of Unknown Kadath, yeah, that's how you say it. I know how to say words. If you read that, like, read Pikmin's model first, because, I don't know, like, Lovecraft, he didn't actually have, like, this huge, like, continuity. He would just kind of throw stuff in, but there's, like, a, let's just say there's a moment where, like, reading this story first pays off, and I was so excited, and... As excited as one can be reading the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, which 
which you know a lot of a lot of people seem to not like it. I think even St. Joshi was like, you know, it's very long and unedited, but I love it so much. But anyway, Pikmin's model. So I already I already confess that I'm a continuity hoe, but you might also want to know that I'm an art hoe. So basically, a story about Randolph Carter, who's in the dream quest or the dream cycle. He's like the protagonist. Um. I mentioned the statement of Randolph Carter in my previous video. Um, but anyway, he has a friend who's like this painter and his stuff is like compared to like Francisco de Goya. Um, and he was a guy, Fus Fuseli. Um, very ghoulish, no pun intended artwork. And I really enjoyed those references and it gets to reveal. And honestly, I just like the ghouls. I like how they're just basically smelly werewolves and yeah, I really enjoyed this one. It's very, compared to certain other um, Lucas stories, very short and sweet. So I combined um, the Silver Key and Through the Gates of the Silver Key, which are both Randolph Carter again. And But Through the Gates of the Silver Key was a collaboration. And I don't know, I think when I read the Silver Key, it really resonated to me because it's about... Randolph Carter kind of coming at a crossroads to his life. He's lost access to the dreamlands. Um, with chron chronological stuff, this is normally put either before or after the dream quest of Unknown Kadath. In my collection, it was put before, which I thought was, it was kind of a good segue. But he's very disillusioned about the world around him, which I feel like as kind of like post-World War One. I don't know. I think Carter might have been a veteran. I can't remember. But post-World War One kind of disillusionment and kind of having trouble with his identity, which through the gates of Sir Key also deals with that. I don't know. It kind of resonated with me in a big way, and it really connected with me. And I know that character stuff isn't really something like Lovecraft is, like, known for, but I think this, also the Shadow Out of Time, does a really good job at making you really kind of pity, but also, like, connect with the characters. And also, this is kind of funny. Also, I don't know where my eyes are going, so just ignore that. But Through the Gates of the Silver Key was interesting to me in the, like, diversity of it, which is kind of, yeah, it's kind of funny. So it's like, it's all these guys listening to the story about Randolph Carter, like, and I know this is probably criticism, but Randolph Carter's stuff, like, it's not from his perspective. It's still in kind of retrospect, and the, um main dude who's talking who is so like actually turns out to be a monster he's called hindu but i think he's also referred to as black i don't remember his ethnicity but then there's actually a, i believe a mixed race professor and then a white dude and then someone else probably another white dude and it was interesting to me how like there's a mixed race professor but he's not really portrayed in a He's portrayed pretty neutrally, and then there's, like, this, like, the white dude turns out to be kind of racist because he refers to, um, the guy who's telling the story turns out, turns out to be a monster. He calls him the N-word, which, yeah, but then the white dude is actually the only one who dies. So I thought that was, I, I didn't expect that, so I thought it was very unusual. And it makes me wonder, like, when it comes to H.P. Lovecraft, like, how much... Like, he actually wrote the story. But, yeah. Silver Key and Through the Gates of the Silver Key. Um, very interesting character study of Randolph Carter. The Color Out of Space, which is actually my favorite Lovecraft story. I heard they made a movie with... I don't know why I keep doing this. They made a movie with Nicolas Cage, uh, which, you know... Um, uh, 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 you know, I haven't seen it, but... Uh, I don't know, it kind of frightens me a bit because I feel like the color of space would be such an the visuals in it and the description of the blasted heath. It would be so good to see visually, but actually, like I'm kind of scared of that movie. But anyway, um, basically, it's this this entity, the the color, which isn't actually a color, but it's like the closest thing we can like, describe it as it falls into this well, and there's this place called the Blasted Heath, which is basically the place that's affected, and, like, slowly over time, it, like, corrupts and changes the landscape. If you saw the movie Annihilation, um, the Shimmer kind of acts like this, even though Jeff Vandermeer is not, let's say he's not a big Lovecraft fan, but 
it's basically they're on this farm is how this family is is um affected by it and kind of broken apart and slowly like picked off and it's very horrifying there's also this like scientific aspect of people studying it um overall just very like one of the few i think this and the rats in the wall just really uh, unsettled me in a big way and i just think the balance between conflict and description of the world and how it slowly changes is just like so compelling and so well done so color out of space i highly recommend it i think whenever someone asks me about look our stories it's the first one i recommend even though it's definitely not one of the most popular the dunwich horror so i usually don't know what i really want to say about this one i feel like it's it kind of reminds me of the thing on the doorstep I don't know, like, whenever I think of, like, ginger rolls and Lovecraft stories, I think of uh, Lavinia from this one and then Azanath. And because there's just so much subtext and there's also a lot of ambiguity about some of the stuff that happened and how, like, Wilbur and, well, I won't go into that, but how he was conceived and whether it was cons consensual, etc. So uh, this one's just, like, very conceptually interesting and, yeah, you know words blah blah transition oh my god i'm a human disaster quality content brought to you by yours truly so the whisperer in darkness so i this is one of the few ones i actually wrote notes for and i literally just wrote this one grew on me and it's true this one did indeed grow on me. I first experienced it in film for format. I think it was HP Lovecraft Historical Society, but they did a black and white adaptation. And overall, like, again, it's been a few months since I read this one, so I don't know what much to say about it. I think it's it's like not the usual lore, but it does uh, reference like Shub Nidrath and Narlato Tap. There's an implication. I really love how Narlatotep, and again, you know, I already told you how, like, I'm, I'm a hoe, but I'm uh, the hugest Narlatotep hoe, because he's, like, I feel like out of all the old, well, he's not an old one, he's an outer god, but out of the gods and the Lovecraft mythos, he has the most character, but I love how he, literally, he's a shapeshifter, he just, with each story, he changes and has, like, a different avatar and a different aspect of him, and I really enjoy that, and I really enjoyed his, um, if my like very minor involvement in this story and i mean yeah you have narlotep in it it's you know instant classic at the mountains of madness okay so this is one of lovecraft's long boys like it's in it's incredibly dense but i just I, I love it i love the feeling of isolation the tension the building like the building of all the creepiness and before the reveal of you know the reveal and how you just do these things like there are these like weird albino penguins and you're just like what's that about and just all these kind of uncanny things you know dog like if you've seen the thing i feel like the atmosphere is very similar just the feeling of you know being like isolation and certain things like this creeping danger and when they eventually get to like the city they find in Antarctica the descriptions it's just so well done so it's just a very like nicely paced I, I I think I read that it wasn't I think I don't know if Lovecraft actually published this in his time I don't think it was very well just received because I can definitely see for like a pulp um like a pulp magazine is like it's just so much to take in but I really enjoyed it I think it's Lovecraft at his best and has some of the best world building. Oh, that's how you do the shadow over in Smith, you know, aka Attack of the Fish Boys. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, spoilers. I think the most interesting part of this um, is the ending for me. Um, how. Like, people have caught on that it's sort of like a tale about the dangers of miscegenation, you know. Like, which miscegenation is like when, like, two people of a different race, you know, marry and, you know, have kids and that sort of thing. I think it's marriage. But yeah, it's just, you know, when people have, like, mixed race children, of course, 
the shadow over Innsmouth, this is, you know, cold of humans, they started, you know, having, you know, kids with mostly, it's mostly human men and fish ladies, and kind of like, you know, the dangers and the degeneration, but what, what's interesting to me, and I'm interested in how, I'm interested in how, like, people interpret the ending, what you're supposed to take away from it, but the main character, like, realizes he's basically part fish boy, and so it's revealed, like, kind of casually at the beginning of the story that the fish people are being sent to concentration camp, like, the remaining people of Innsmouth, or Innsmouth, as it's pronounced sometimes, and he basically, at first, he's the main character, he's suicidal, realizing this, which is interesting because it reminds me of Lovecraft when he found out that he had, like, Welsh ancestry and I think also Irish ancestry. He was not very happy because he thought, oh, I have pure English blood, but at first he's suicidal, but then he decides, oh, no, I'm actually going to free my brethren, and, uh, like, it's almost weirdly triumphant. But I don't know, like, maybe, it, like, for, I don't know Lovecraft's actual intent, but it could also be seen as, of course, given that it's very, like, damning of, you know, racial intermixing. It could be like, oh, no, you know, he's one of the fish baddies now. But overall, um, also just the, you know, quote, the action, like, when he goes up on the roof and he's being chased, it's, it's just very well done, you know. Lovecraft stuff is not what I would say is action-packed, but this one is, like, the roof and the chase, I think that's one of the best parts, and even, like, when they made the game, The Call of Cthulhu, which is The Shadow of Innsmouth, I think, actually, you know, that, you know, hearing the people, you know, coming to get him, and the slow reveal is as he's running, you know, he, he looks back, and he, you know, he's hiding, or he's hiding, and he sees the actual, like, the deep ones, um, and he describes them. I just think it's just, it's very well done. This one also had a sort of troubled history where it got, I think it got published in his own book because it's, I, I believe it's novella Lang, like At the Mountains of Mad Madness and The Case of Charles Dexter War Ward and of course The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, which, wow, I actually didn't put it on this list, but yeah, ret retrospectively I'll do that, but it was published as his own novella, but it was, like, full of typos, and, you know, H.P. Lovecraft was, like, this very, you know, stringent editor, so he didn't appreciate that, but yeah, Shadow over Innsmouth, the Innsmouth in which there is a shadow, thumbs up. So, yeah, since I did, I totally forgot about it and didn't put it in my list, I'm going to talk about the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath now, and... It's basically, I feel like, and I don't, this is entirely accurate, but it's kind of like, it reminds me of like Alice Through the Looking Glass or Alice's Avengers in Wonderland, except darker. Like, it's pure fantasy. Like, there's creepy stuff, sure. It's like a more dangerous Wonderland. Like, not quite like American McGee's um, Alice, but, you know, like, you'll get it maybe enslaved or murdered there, but... It's pure, like, Lord Dunsany kind of fantasy, and it's just basically this, as it says, it's a quest, and I really enjoy it as a culmination of, you know, Randolph Carter, and if you, like, read Lovecraft chronologically, which I do recommend, and you've read everything before this, you know, my first introduction to him is the statement of Randolph Carter where he's, you know, extremely nervous and scared, and basically he says, you know, he says, bye, and I mean, he, I think he would have been helpless to help us run our way, but his friend gets murdered, you know, he's just a bystander witnessing this trauma, and then you kind of follow him as he discovers more horrors, like in Pikmin's model, and then in the Silver Key, you see him, like, kind of, like, broken down and trying to find his identity, and eventually, you know, he finds a way to get back into the dreamlands, and he has this quest to see the Sunset City, where... And he wants to see the gods where you're not supposed to approach the gods. But he wants to do it so he can get access to the Sunset City. And it's a lot. And it's also, like, it wasn't very well received because it was very kind of long. And some would say very long-winded. And it wasn't seen as very well edited. And I, I don't believe it the, what published. It was actually, like, finished. It wasn't, like, polished that much, which... I don't know. I mean, I just think it really works. I think just, it's just pure, like, the just seeing the world he creates on in the rental car, and of course, like, all the continuity stuff, because 
you know, the cast of Ulthar, a Pikmin's model, all these, like, little stories, like, they all add up, and they all connect to, like, this big, you know, this bigger universe, and, of course, it also has, you know, my boy, my child, the evil Narlato Tap, and giving this big villain monologue, and it's just, the scope is, like, it's just so epic, like, the spires of unknown Kadath, and the way he describes the Sunset City, and you know, all the different creatures you encounter. It's just, it's so much fun, and I just really love it. Okay, the dreams in the witch house. Or is it the dream in the witch house? Eh. So, this one I actually first encountered. If you've ever seen the show Masters of Horror, they did an adaptation. I used to get, because I remember there was like a rat dude, you know, Brown Jenkins, but I never remembered, like, was that dream in the witch house or rats in the walls? Because, you know, both have rats or a rat. And I was confused, but it was indeed the dream. The dreams in the witch house. And again, got my boy in it. And. But overall, like, it's just, the take of witchcraft on it is interesting because it does kind of deal with, like, cl kind of classic New England stuff. You got Narlatotep is kind of, like, portrayed as, you know, he's the black man and which is kind of like this, he's kind of like, and normally, like, it'd be, like, how Satan is portrayed. And when I say black, like, often, like, if you've ever read um The Devil and Tom Walker, like, the, the devil is described as black, but it doesn't mean, like he's a like a black man like he like skin tone and it's normally like and devil and tom walker he's smeared with ash and so it's like he's literal darkness and of course you know that still has like you know comparing you know dark you know always connecting darkness to evil it does have his own you know connotations that can lead to racism but anyway like the, the, he's like so much in our love tab like it's connected to how like you know the devil and like americana is often portrayed but you know it's not the devil you know the witch who sells it like i don't know if like saying sells her, sells her soul is correct but it's you know this outer chaos god and it's just using these kind of very traditional things and connecting it with lovecraft's the kind of more odd and non-traditional looks because it, it like looks but like i've always found lovecraft interesting because i he believe he does and you know interesting is a word i use a lot but hey um but he he's like very he talks about how he's not into like very like traditional gothic like he finds like you know vampires that sort of thing very boring which can't can't agree can't agree with my boy um hp dadcraft um but he finds, you know, all that traditional stuff, you know, the monster in the castle, very boring. But he actually, he plays on it a lot. And, but also, and I'm rambling, but with the witchcraft, I found it very interesting how, there we go again, like how the witchcraft is connected to geometry. Like, I believe his name is Gilman. But when Gilman's like, I think in bed, he's looking at his room, like the geometry becomes um, probably non-Euclidean, but it becomes like odd and alien and the fact that her powers and the witchcraft it's not just of course there's like you know the sacrifice and these kind of like more traditional images but it's also connected to like this kind of mathematical and scientific thing is just really fascinating to me a very fascinating take and yeah dreams in the witch house you know the witch house in which there are dreams recommend good we did it. We make video. But we're not done yet. So, the thing on the doorstep, aka the thing Lovecraft Nerd Psychoanalyze. God, I was so salty when I made this document. But that's not actual salt at all because I'm one of those Lovecraft nerds who the portrayal of gender um, and the thing on the doorstep because it has one of the more prominent female characters and Lovecraft stories and the idea of the, of the fact that it's like a man's soul imposed on a woman's body and there's kind of like this queer aspect to it um which you know like can cr crop up every now and again I believe it was the outsider that also had people discuss that um I know it's very complex and it also has like one of the best like the beginning sentence of this one is just one of my favorites and again this is one that isn't like a very well received in by Lovecraft scholars like it's 
they say, oh, it has hackney pros, and, but I didn't have any issues with it. I thought it was very compelling, and just, you know, the reveal and all that, it's just the implications of, like, when you really sit and think about, like, what people have gone through, and what happened, and just there's so much that's unsaid, like, you have this man who married this woman who's actually her dad, but, you know, he doesn't know it, and essentially him if he had sex with her, which is, it's never, like, spoken about, because, you know, Lovecraft didn't really go into that all that much, but it's like, I mean, that would basically be rape, because he's being, he's having sex with someone, like, he doesn't, he thinks he's having sex with one person, but it's another person who's, like, it's actually her dad inside her body, and there's even, like, discussions, like, where, as an ass, like, well, descriptions rather, where she's like in an all girls boarding school and she's like leering at the girls because it's, it's secretly this old dude in this girl's body and it's just, and, and uh, it's like a, her younger body too. It's just, yeah. Yeah, it like gives you nightmares in a way that, you know, evil tentacle gods don't. At least not for me. The Shadow Out of Time. Okay, guys. This one is totally baller. Like, listen, all my 10 subscribers, you just gotta hold on. Like, this one actually kind of blew my mind a little about how much, like, when I read it, I was like, yeah, you know, this was good, but, you know, I really sat down and thought about it, and just the concept of ha having, like, an alien inside your brain and dealing with, like, amnesia and sort of, like, dissociation and trauma and people, like, leaving you because you act weird, just all the implications of, like, how it just could be, like, metaphorical for so many things, you know, like, identity and, like, mental health and also PTSD, because when I first read it, like, the main character, his name is, like, Nathan Peasley Winsgate, it's a very, um, Lovecraft name, like, it, it's just, like, this dude goes through so much shit, but at the same time, like, you can kind of understand, like, if he, you know, he just what wakes up and he's an entirely different person and he, he has an alien entity and I almost wonder if, like, a, a y the yith, um, that, that's inside him, like, if it literally, like, it's, like, it repels people, like, people, like, it's not even, like, they're just looking at him and, like, they're, like, yo, you're acting weird. It's, like, they literally can, like, on the subconscious level sense that, you know, something's not right and it repels them and, and it kind of just makes me think about, you know, if, when you struggle with, like, mental health, how, like, you, you can kind of be convinced that everybody hates you, and you just, like, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Like, I feel like I'm humaning okay enough, but I feel like everything I say, you know, it's just, it's just wrong, and people don't like me, and it's just, like, so interesting. And again, I, I think I mentioned this, but it's just in terms of, like, character study and thinking about, you know, the trauma the main character goes through and the abandonment and him really wanting to find out what happened to him when he was younger. It's just very interesting, like a very interesting journey. And yeah, because we, we know Emily, she thinks all Lovecraft is interesting, except when it's not, except when it's like him imitating Samuel Johnson or like that story that was like Princess Bride, but it was making fun of Robert Chambers romance is, but you know, yeah. The Haunter in the Dark, okay? I don't remember shit about this one, it's that this dude goes into this church, right? And then he's possessed by, you know, my boy, Narlotto Tap, and then he gets like struck by lightning, and I can't remember like if that because I seem like, I'm, I might have made this up, or I might have dreamed this, but I could have swore that Yith are sensitive to lightning, or maybe I just, like, made up. But apparently, like, the gods are all sensitive to lightning, so, or, uh, yeah, actually, I made that up. Because what happens when a dude, like, is struck by lightning, he dies, okay? And then God's like, well, I guess I can't possess this corpse, which I don't see why not, I mean... Narlotep literally walked around with a dude's face and hands in one story, but he's like, yeah, I'm out. But, yeah, good. Good story. Good stories. Good content. Remember to unsubscribe. And, okay. Yeah, so we're gonna wrap up this, um, 
disaster and I want to talk about some of the collaborations I talked about I did talk about some of like through the gates of the silver key I can't remember if I mentioned like under the pyramids which is also interesting but I don't really have to say about but it's literally like this Harry Houdini stand-in because Lovecraft wrote it for Houdini like stand-in going under pyramids you know and yeah cool yeah enjoyed it but a lot of um like when i read the horror in the museum collection a lot of the collaborations are like somewhat interesting conceptually but they're also kind of hot messes but i did want to give a shout out to uh zilia bishop um some of the collaborations he did with her i thought even some of the ones that were uh, critically maligned i really enjoyed and thought were interesting so the Curse of Yig, The Mound, and Medusa's Coil. Um, so I think generally The Mound is seen as the strongest, which I would agree, and, and then Medusa's Coil is seen as the weakest. And so these all kind of connect in that there's like these, this like, like Yig, there's like the snake god and like these snake creatures. Um, but yeah, I thought The Mound was probably the most compelling, but Medusa's Coil, so... I like, I 100% get why, you know, if you're a Lovecraft fan and you're all about the atmosphere and all that, how you wouldn't like it. And, like, the thing about Medusa's Coil is that it's very character-centric and it has certain conflicts that you don't really see in any of the other Lovecraft stories. Like, there's a love triangle. Because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure someone will, but I believe Zillia Bishop was a romance writer, and so... Like, Lovecraft stuff wasn't really her genre, I don't believe, but she did um, romance. And so it's like there's a lot of, like, character conflict in here because there's, like, a priestlet. Uh, wow. You know, words talking. It's almost midnight here. Anyway, there's this priestess called Marceline. Um, and she marries one dude who I think they're introduced by a friend. It's implied there's sexual tension between... Marceline and the friend, possibly that she's even having an affair, and also, like, that friend is a painter who wants to paint her naked, and so there's all this sexual tension in, well, between the, you know, Marceline and the dude she's not married with, and the dude she's married with gets mad, and it le eventually leads to extreme domestic violence, which is kind of the narrative kind of justifies it because it's like oh well, like one like there are two revelations one more horrible than the other one is that she was like a snake witch lady or something yeah you know kind of par for the course honestly but then there's the even more horrifying re revelation are you ready for this marceline was like she was a black lady right but she like would cover it up with foundation i don't even know how like if you have a husband how you like hide that or like that's a lot of foundation but anyway like literally the ending line is that marceline was a negress so even more horrifying was that she was a black woman pretending to be a white woman and it's just yeah it's a like i think the reason like this one is so maligned is that obviously it's very racist yeah you know i can't deny that but it's also it's just so interesting to me and Again, I understand why these sort of, like, the character drama stuff, like, it's not very, like, typical in Lovecraft and people hate it, but I don't know, I just love it. I think it's mostly because, as a reader and writer, I love character-driven stuff, and the idea of, like, this, like, character drama and these characters keeping secrets with, from each other and the sexual tension and all that drama and, like, this Lovecraftian horror narrative is just something that's so fascinating, you know, just personally to me, you know, because, you know, I'm weird. Yeah, I guess I'll end the video now. Thanks for watching.